Um, I want to continue uh, with this topic. Uh, it's uh, you know, really great to uh, be able to follow up such a great uh, speaker, sort of bringing us some really key aspects of open uh, access publishing. Uh, the task I was given was to talk more about uh, using and sharing data in sort of an open access kind of way, uh, thinking about how it works in terms of uh, promoting research, or as I sort of cheekily put in, fun and profit. Uh, but we got to cross that out. But, uh, but I, I do think it is really sort of fun uh, particularly the way that we, uh, I've sort of come at, at, at this. And just to give you a bit of a bit of some background here, my own research is really focused on using uh, geotagged social media data. It's probably the easiest way to think about that. Everything from geotagged tweets, Flickr photos, Foursquare check-ins, what have you. All that social media that everyone's sort of busily doing on their phones uh, is stuff that's really useful for me as a geographer to look at, to ask questions, to, to, to look at some things uh, in terms of what, what does this show us about society? How, how is this changing the way society functions? How we see, see places, how we interact with each other, how we interact with places and so forth. And the sort of graphic that I use a lot is imagining uh, this is sort of what we're, work, we're walking through today. Uh, there's a normal material environment, but there's this whole layer of information. Uh, it's not just social media, that, but that's what I sort of really focus on, so that's why it's all put up in this, in this particular graphic. Uh, but we're surrounded by it. Our phones can access this in interesting ways, and it really just changing, uh, potentially changing the way we see uh, a particular place, uh, the way that we interact with each other, the way we use a city and so forth. And it could just be through the interface of your phone, but there's all these sort of, there's sort of these fancier gadgets as well, such as Google Glass. Um, though, quite honestly, if ever, anyone's ever tried Google Glass, it doesn't work that well. It's kind of really annoying. Uh, but that sort of gets at the idea. And I, I just wanted to give you sort of a taste of that in terms of the kind of research where I'm coming from to sort of explain um, how this then translates into uh, sharing data, collaborating with other people in some sort of new and sometimes, quite honestly, uh, surprising directions for me. Um, so I'll talk about that later on. But this is just sort of essentially where I'm coming from. Uh, and also towards that end, I just want to put this slide up here to show that we actually have done serious academic work on it. We have publications, because the next slide looks like this, uh, which might lead you to doubt that last slide. So that slide was just sort of like showing my, you know, this is, ac this is real academic work. There is an element, a another sort of element to this as well, which really comes out of this floating sheep, uh, which we call floating sheep research blog. It's been in existence for about five years now. And uh, for complicated reasons, we ended up with the name Floating Sheep. Uh, don't need to go into it. But it's, it's really is really a, a way of getting out and exploring, in a lot of cases, some of the less serious side of this. Um, but also uh, some of the real, uh, real serious side, side of stuff. Uh, actually, right before I uh, started here today, we, uh, the, the people I'm working with, uh, who I should point out, all the folks listed here uh, were either uh, are either currently students at uh, University of Kentucky or, or uh, are uh, formerly students. Um, everyone uh, part of the Floating Sheep group uh, had been at University of Kentucky at one time or the other uh, working uh, with me and other people in geography. Um, but one of the things we were doing right before I got here was looking uh, at uh, tweets containing the word, word uh, Ebola, uh, which is kind of interesting, some nice sort of visualizations we're coming out with. One of the things that's really sort of surprising, well, sort of remarkable for us, is that there's not a lot of social media activity going on in Africa for lots of reasons in terms of per capita income and access and things like that. Uh, but that's one, this is one example that there is a lot going in particular places. Um, not particularly surprising. Also, it really sort of shows the sort of panic moment uh, within the United States when, every when everyone started tweeting about Ebola. Um, it's, it's some issues uh, for interpretation, uh, but uh, uh, since we don't really have that research, let me, let me give you uh, another sort of example. This is one we did uh, some, time, some time ago, which uh, was looking at the county level uh, within the US and simply looking at the number of tweets that contain two terms, either the term church or the term beer. Uh, and the places, the counties highlighted in red in the southeast were places that tweeted a lot more uh, or had, had tweets that had uh, the term church in it a lot more, and the places uh, with uh, the term uh, with, that were blue had the term beer in it a lot more. Uh, this is one we did just, uh, you know, there's some interesting outcomes in terms of sort of cultural markers, the extent to which this sort of social media, da me media data 
uh, can reflect what's going on, on the ground? Because that's actually a really big question in a lot of this. You'll see this coming up in some of the other research I talk about. Uh, to what extent is this, 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 this sort of information uh, biased? How is it biased? To, to what extent is it reflective of what's going on in that place that, that, uh, that it's being drawn from? All kinds of questions. This is sort of what we put out here as an example of the kind of the kind of uh, ways, the uh, kind of questions you, one might ask for this. Um, this is sort of a, a, the first step, a really early step in doing this. Um, and towards this end, we started developing what we refer to as Dolly. Uh, again, sort of a play off the floating sheep, Dolly being the first clone sheep. Uh, and as you can tell, we sort of had to force the acronym to, uh, to work. Uh, I'm not entirely happy with what it came out. But the idea, one of the things that we that developed out of the, you know, working with, uh, uh, with the, the Floating Sheep Project and the larger project is one of the, the things that prevented a lot of people from doing similar work is just getting access to this stuff. Um, it's big data in lots of ways. The, the database we have right now, we've been collecting every geotagged tweet in the world since July 2012. Uh, I actually don't know the number. I'm guessing it's about 9 billion or so right now. Um, we're certainly within that ballpark. I know it was 7 billion a couple months ago, and just sort of guessing on the, on the growth rate. Uh, and so it's, it's actually quite an undertaking. It's one, of th and, and it's one of the things that you have to do if you want to use this data, particularly over time, because for most people, the Twitter data sort of falls off, it stops being accessible after about two weeks. Um, there's some exceptions, and there's some there's some pay services that are very expensive, which you can get some access to this information. But uh, through the, the way that Twitter sets up its data, through uh, an API, an application uh, programming interface, it makes this data available. But this is really an attempt to sort of archive it in various ways uh, and use it both for our research, uh, but also try to make it available to a larger group of research, uh, resources. And, we, we were quite fortunate to uh, get some uh, seed funding from the, the VP for Research at University of Kentucky, as well as, well as the College of Arts and Sciences uh, and the Department of Geography to put this together. But in, in a lot of ways, it's really sort of run on a shoestring. We use all kinds of open source uh, technology. I want to do a shout out here to Atta Porthaus, who's a PhD student working with me, who's really responsible for making this all together, putting, putting the system uh, together in which this works. Um, so all kinds of uh, various open source software. Uh, I can't answer any specific questions about this slide, uh, but if you give them to me, I can forward them on. I can, ask, I can answer a few, but this is actually, this is really uh, Atta's, Atta's work. He unfortunately was not able to be here today. Uh, but I do want to give this out that this, and part of it, we were using all kinds of open source software as much as we could because we were trying to run this pretty much on a shoestring, and uh, open source is free. Uh, open source software is free in lots of ways. So our first vision, and this sort of gets at sort of the difficulty of making this open source, was something like this. This is what we call the Dolly interface. Uh, there's a URL if you want to take a look at uh, some of the background on on Dolly, but this is what we had in mind. It would be this map interface. You could put in certain search terms. It would give you some information on uh, various, oops, oops, there, various concentrations, you know, blue versus red. This is sort of a, a core shading uh, kind of thing. You could also look at it over time, how it changes over time and things like that. Uh, we actually spent a lot of time and energy on this, uh, and because and our vision, or at least our early vision, was we wanted to, we had all this great data, we were using it, but it was just too much. We really didn't have the resources in terms of time. Uh, you know, time was like the, the, the biggest resources in working with this kind of stuff uh, to do what one really could do. There's all kinds of interesting questions out there, because again, it was geotag tweets around the world. Um, and uh, we just didn't have the capacity to work with it. So we had this idea that this would be a way that other people could explore, uh, work with this data. Um, for lots of reasons, which I don't need to go into, uh, this didn't work uh, very well. Uh, it, was, it, it just, perhaps it was overambitious, perhaps we really didn't know what we were doing. We were working with a software programmer who was really talented, but always seemed to be thinking sort of in sort of 90 degrees from what we were thinking. Uh, and in the end, it was, uh, it, it really, never got, uh, really never got deployed. Uh, so uh, we, we spin it up occasionally, uh, but it's actually not active right now. This is our original vision. 
Uh, the existing vision is something much more simple. Uh, took you know a couple hours to develop, and it's essentially a query interface. Uh, this is not publicly available. The other one was supposed to be publicly available behind sort of a, a pay or a, not a paywall, but a password wall. Uh, this one is just something we use for ourselves. And it's really pretty simple. It's straightforward. Search terms. You can search on all kinds of things on keyword, hashtags, time, uh, you know, other sort of variables as well. Uh, but what we do this now, we, we'll do the search and then we'll download uh, various uh, uh, cell, uh, Excel files, CSV files, things like that. Depends on the actual search. You can get, I mean, if you start with a database of 9 billion, you can quickly really get very large data sets. Uh, so that's sort of the interface that we're working with now. Uh, and uh, there's even actually a more sort of pr uh, primitive, actually probably the most useful one, is just a command line interface, which is useful if you know what you're doing, but really not user friendly any sort of way. Um, and so we went from this idea of let's make this more accessible to a lot of people to, okay, how can we share this data in sort of a collaborative process, sometimes collaborative, but not always, uh, that also doesn't drive us nuts because you know, in the end, this is very sort of labor intensive. We're the ones having to go out and do the queries, gather the data, uh, clean it up depending on, on uh, some, of, uh, some of the criteria. And I will say that's something uh, I could talk about more uh, later on. But uh, depending, on, uh, depending on who it is and the kind of questions they're asking, uh, there is some issues with uh, you know, privacy in this. I mean, a lot of people tweet. Uh, a lot, and there's all kinds of privacy issues. So we sort of t evaluate that on a on a case by case basis. I can go in more detail if you want, but essentially we put the word out through various social media channels and other things that this data, this resource is out there. If people are interested in a project, uh, they can access to the data. We we have sort of a, a bit of a uh, uh, a bit of a uh, screening process. Not really a screening process. We, we we ask people to say, well, what's your research question? What kind of data do you want? Uh, and you know, we'll we'll check it. And as long as it's not a project we're actively working on, we generally will share the data. But those just those two simple questions actually keep a lot of people from pursuing it, because unless you have a clear thought through question, it's kind of it's a lot of work to uh, to go through. So uh, that's just sort of how we we we, uh, we work with this. And I just want to run through a couple examples of projects that uh, last week I sent an email out to uh, people who had gotten some data from us and said, hey, I'm doing this talk. I'd like to have some examples of what people have done with this. Uh, and so this is uh, the result. Of the ones I'm showing here is probably about half of the people have gotten some data. Other people have been, uh, haven't, have, didn't, have, didn't actually end up using it much or didn't have a whole lot of luck. So this is just sort of an, an example of some things that have come out. Uh, and I'll, I'll just run through these now. So first one, this is an example of uh, Brian uh, Schaefer. He's at the University of Southern California in the geography department there. He's actually working on a graduate thesis. And his question was, you know, can we use this marker of social media, Twitter uh, specifically, as, what was he calling it, as a, as a indicator of displacement, essentially gentrification is another question he was looking at. Uh, and so uh, he actually came up, what I thought was quite clever, one of his, his key words was Starbucks. So tweets containing the word Starbucks were uh, an indicator, indicator of gentrification. He had a whole list of one, but Starbucks was one he found particularly useful. And I will, I will say, I didn't actually, I'm not actually involved with this research, so I can't really speak to all the intricacies and whether how defendable it is and all that sort of thing. This, this is my sort of summary based on what they, he sent me. Um, and essentially that it seems to be a useful indicator to some extent of tracking gentrification. Um, really interesting to me because my background is actually in, in urban geography, economic geography. So this, this whole process of how neighborhoods transition within an urban, in an urban uh, center is actually pretty interesting for me. Uh, but again, this is just sort of the, the first example of, 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 of this. Uh, another one which I think is actually, well, much more close to home, uh, Jay Christian, who's actually an assistant professor over in the School of Public, or the College of Public Health, Epidemiology, uh, was working with some of our data. Looking uh, specifically, we pulled together a, uh, a data set based on tweets containing various uh, references to fast food restaurants. 
McDonald's, KFC, I forget the exact uh, list. And basically, he did a fairly simple, at, at least initial, initially simple, uh, just sort of correlation. Uh, correlations looking at this. I'll show you some of the results. Uh, you can see, so it was tweets containing the words McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, and so forth. Uh, and then compared it to uh, a number of indicators of uh, health. He did obesity uh, that also showed this sort of uh, the, uh, this correlation, uh, as well as this one is the mean reported fruit and vegetable servings per day. And so there's seemingly this sort of interesting connection between people having this talking about fast food, at least tweeting about fast food, um, and sort of public health indicators, or at least sort of uh, dietary consumption uh, indicators as well. Uh, he did this at both the state level, but he also did it at the, uh, the sort of an aggregate level of counties within Kentucky. I don't quite understand how this aggregation works. It has to do with how the, the da other data set he was using uh, was, uh, was processed. So again, sort of an interesting, an interesting initial result uh, on some of this. He's actually doing, making a presentation um, at uh, a conference uh, I think in a, just a couple months, actually, uh, based on this. Another example, also at the University of Kentucky, uh, Nathan Jacobs is an assistant professor in computer science. Uh, and he does a lot of work looking at, uh, well, online webcams. Uh, these are various cams that are out there, publicly available, uh, that, and I have to say, I'm probably doing horrible disservice to him um, uh, with, uh, with this, this summary, but essentially using these, uh, these webcams to uh, capture images and see, uh, sort of see what can be developed from these kind of images. Uh, things like you know, calculating where snowfall is or calculating uh, leaf, uh, you know, uh, leaf changes, color changes, and things like that. Uh, and one of the things he started to work with, and this is really, really preliminary, so this, I just asked him for some, can you send me some pictures that I can put up uh, as I talk? Uh, about trying to compare these changes they're capturing from these video feeds with what's, going, what's being tweeted uh, nearby these video feeds. Um, so that's really, really, really prelim uh, preliminary work. Another example is, uh, this is also uh, Jay Christian, but we also started working with uh, Klaus Lindman, uh, who's also an uh, assistant professor at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, uh, looking at questions about changes in behavior. Uh, in this particular case, uh, pre or uh, pre and post uh, getting a flu shot. And this is something that we did, and this, uh, Atta and I are also uh, uh, working on this project. We essentially identified 16,000 tweets that had the term flu shot in it, and then we all manually coded each of these tweets. Well, we, did, we actually coded, I think we each coded about 6,000 each, so there was some overlap. And whenever the two, the coding uh, coincide, we identified we identify that as a tweet that actually represents uh, a, a, a tweet about getting a flu shot. And then starting to look at uh, pre-vaccination, what we're calling tweet space, essentially, essentially based on their tweets, how, how much did that person move uh, versus post-tweet post space uh, and trying to do a comparison. We're still very much early stages for this. Uh, but Jay was nice enough to make this uh, this map, uh, sort of comparing, you know, these sort of these ellipses that we have in terms based on how far, how much did people move uh, before uh, uh, or pre uh, flu shot and uh, post flu shot. Um, another example. Uh, this is someone uh, out of the University of Washington, uh, Jing Hu, uh, who uh, was looking at this idea of data clouds. Uh, we he was looking pr uh, particularly at the. Uh, the last presidential election in King County, Washington. Um, this is not sort of an example of this so much, uh, but looking at you know what 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 kind of data is contained within within these tweets. There's lots of interesting work. This is just uh, all along these lines, both algorithmically and coding by hand. Uh, big question how you go about doing this, uh, but just another example of this of this sort of stuff. Let me see. I think I got one more example. Yeah, one final example. I'll skip over this one. Uh, some uh, similar sort of project, uh, this is uh, with some geographers out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, looking at uh, the, what was happening within the, the Twitterverse uh, after the Boston Marathon bombing. A uh, couple sort of questions in terms of how, you know, it, it's all tied into sort of disaster and sort of hazards research in terms of, you know, what kind of information is coming right around the spot and so forth. I don't want to go into that because this is actually research I'm not working on myself. Uh, but some of the things just sort of coming out here and sort of 
quickly after the, uh, the uh, bombings, 15 minutes after, you start seeing uh, the first signs of explosions, uh, finish, breaking, these indications that something's going on. The real sort of idea about this is can these sort of st uh, streams of social media be used for sort of hazard response and so forth. Uh, later on, it was uh, these examples, you know, this is, the, what is, this? This is uh, two days after, so it was much more focused on the arrests, the suspects, and things like that, the sort of changing discourse within the social media. This is all geocoded within and around, uh, within and around Boston. Um, and I think uh, I'll skip over the next one. This is just some, some spatial, uh, spatial uh, representations. There are other projects, but again, the real, uh, the real thing about this is, from our perspective, we have we built this resource. We're actively using it in our own research, uh, but there's lots of potential uh, for lots of people. I mean, Boston, the Boston bombing, an in interesting question. It's not something we simply have the bandwidth to deal with. We're not going to look at that. So why not carve out some of that data, give it these th to these folks? And uh, learn from them. That's one of the things that we've been uh, been trying to do with uh, with, with Dolly. Um, again, so part of this is also coming out of the, the this larger project, the, the New Mappings Collaboratory, out of the Department of Geography and the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd probably say is one of the things that re we've really sort of hit in, uh, and this gets back to the bandwidth problem uh, in terms of dealing with this data, is we simply don't have enough uh, skill sets who can work with this kind of data, which is one of the reasons we're now working uh, directly to try to set up uh, some online uh, graduate uh, education programs. Uh, we got a grant from the, uh, the ELI program, University of Kentucky, to put these, to bring some of this stuff online. Uh, and so that's where we're working towards next. And I, I'll, I'll just stop at that point and thank you. If you wanna, if you wanna check out the Floating Sheep, just floatingsheep.org, we're also active on Twitter as well. So I'll stop there.